All right, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sven, and I'm here with my colleagues David Anukriti, who is representing two groups tonight, Aslam, and our colleague Johan, who's not here tonight. And I would like to introduce you to a situation that's here on this picture. And I think it's pretty obvious what the, the dilemma in this situation is. Um, one thing that I would like to point out is, well, there's two things. On the one hand, we see a person with a little child who is obviously not in a very good financial or societal position. But secondly, we can also look at the type of waste that's there on the ground. If you pay attention, you can see that most of this waste is actually plastic. And we know what's the problem with plastic is that it doesn't go away. It stays there for hundreds or thousands of years. And it can also be toxic in many cases. So now I would like to ask you to look at this slide. Because what is this slide really illustrating is that there are two problems two huge issues nowadays that are coinciding at the same places very often. And obviously, it's not a coincidence. So we're talking about plastic waste and poverty. And so what we see at this slide is that there are many regions that have the same problems at the same place. So the very poorest people in this world live in the areas where we have the most plastic waste. And that's obviously because those are the easy areas to dump our plastic waste. Now, there is one duo of American entrepreneurs who could not stand this any longer, and they started two years ago by thinking about how can we address this issue. And before I go into any detail, I want you to know that this is a business model that's still being developed. So a lot of the information that I'm going to present to you is information that is not completely implemented. There will be a lot of quantitative data missing. So please bear with me because we still believe that this is a very good business model, both in an economic sense, in a social sense, and in an environmental sense. So the question that they asked is that, how can we get rid of this waste in a way that also alleviates these people out of poverty? And they said, well, the problem is that people consider this waste as waste. So what can we, make, what can we do to ensure that this waste is becoming so valuable in people's perception that it becomes too valuable to throw away? And so they, their idea is the, the social plastic movement, where social plastic basically is the idea of creating uh, plastic, a community, uh, uh, plastic, sorry, plastic in communities that is too valuable to throw away and turns into a currency. So their idea is to, by combining community, uh, 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 let's come up with a good English word, community distribution and community pickup of, of plastic waste with uh, combined plastic uh, recycling and 3D printers, they can actually turn this waste into products that can be sold to alleviate these people out of poverty and get rid of waste at the same time. So let's look at how this then works in practice. So we have a, a plastic bank local uh, a point, or a local collection and production point. And basically what they do is they work together with the local community collectors. This could be either the community itself that's going to help to collect this waste, or it could be together with government uh, waste pickup and pr processing companies. So they will get the waste to the plastic bank site. The plastic bank then offers the production capabilities in the form of the recycling machines and the 3D printer that they have developed themselves. It's a patented 3D printer technology that can work with this type of plastic. And there they offer these production capabilities to local entrepreneurs. So local entrepreneurs can work in this workshop, in this collection point, to actually use this recycled waste and turn that into products. So on the one hand, we have the, what we call the social plastic products that can be sold in local shops. And, that, uh, and you can think about, for example, iPhone covers or, or any type of like product that will be able to sell in that local community that is relatively uh, uh, affordable but still generates them uh, a revenue. On the other hand, we have the basic needs product. So a portion of the production is actually going to go back to the local community in the form of, for example, rooftops. We can think of anything having to, having to do with sanitation, anything having to do with improving their living conditions. So these will be either free of char charge or at a very low uh, fee. Then the second stream is, and this is probably the largest stream based on our analysis, is the social plastic that cannot be used for 3D printing simply because if you look at this process, what is going to be the bottleneck is the 3D printer because it's usually quite slow. So there will be a lot of this recycled plastic material that has to be sold in a way. So this will simply be sold at the commodity markets globally. So this will just be sold as 
plastic on the global on the global community commodity markets, but with the additional benefit that is called social plastic, and that's part of this movement. And then these in industrial producers then can sell these social plastic products or the products that they make out of this recycled plastic to Western consumers. Now we have two key elements here that are very important to make this model work. One is to educate and create awareness in the local communities. So why would people actually start helping out in this field uh, if they see the benefits only at a later stage? And secondly, we have the two key resources, so the mixed plastic recycling technology and the 3D printer. Now, if you look at the revenue streams, we have basically two main revenue streams. One is the sale of the social plastic at the commodity markets to the industrial producers, which would be the largest part of uh, plastic banks' revenues. And the other one is the sale of the, uh, the social plastic products uh, via the local shops. Now, let's look at the value proposition. So, we have identified four groups of, of players that we are offering value to. And they are basically either at the local or the global level. So on the local level, we have the community that basically gets their waste clean up and they get access to basic needs goods. At the same time, this is for them either free access or at a very low price. And this is uh, according to a principle that we have invented called delayed collaborative consumption. So basically, you collaborate to create consumption by, in the first step, the community participates to collect the waste, and in the second step, they get the basic needs products back. And finally, if you look at the reference offer, basically you can either not clean it up, which is a problem that we've just established, um, or you have waste management companies, which in these areas typically are very expensive and they're not very well at doing their job, or you have individual collection offers, uh, efforts. Then if you look at entrepreneurs, there is another, uh, the perceived value to them is obviously they have access to these produ uh, production means, so to the 3D printers, through the uh, mixed recycling technology that they otherwise wouldn't have. Um, that will be relatively cheap or even free for them because that's not the key source of revenues for Plastic Bank, so they can offer it very cheaply to them. And the reference offer would be either to work with their own technologies, which is near, not near as good as the 3D printers, or to use other materials rather than plastic. Then if you look at the industrial producers that can buy the social plastic at the commodity markets globally, they have a different shaded product. So they don't buy normal plastic that it would otherwise buy at the commodity market. They buy social plastic, which has, of course, additional different shading value. Uh, and they can claim that they do something to, re to reduce the environmental impact of their product. Um, so they purchase it at market price, so there's no difference there compared to normal plastic. Uh, the, off the reference offers either they could produce it themselves or they could purchase regular plastic. And then if you finally look at the consumers in the Western world or in developed countries, they get access to social plastic products. So for the people that care about these things, they will have a product available to them that they can actually uh, buy that looks a lot better than the normal plastic story. And um, they can claim that they contribute to the improvement of environmental and social position in the uh, situation in these countries. Now, there's not a significant price difference for them if these products would be actually exported from the local situation uh, where the waste is gathered, it might actually be m even cheaper for them. And um, th the, the, the reference offer is to, to either buy like their everyday regular plastic uh, products or conventionally recycled plastic, which obviously doesn't have the same story and, and, and differentiated value to it. So then we can, of course, say, well, to most of these players, we're really offering a game-changing value proposition. So we're offering more value for a lower price or for the same price compared to the, the reference offer that's out there. Now, quickly about the profit equation, and this is where it becomes a little bit tricky because this is where the information is not very well available. So what do we talk about with profit equation? It's the capital employed, it's the cost, and it's the sales or the revenues. Well, in this case, what we can say about the, the capital employed, the most of the cost is going to come from the location, so the site, the recycling machines, and the 3D printers, and maybe to a certain extent the collection efforts or collection bins or collection wagons or whatever they use. Uh, in terms of cost, the, the most of the cost is probably going to be in HR and the recycling efforts and energy uh, costs that are involved there. And the sales is either going to come from the plastic products or the plastic materials on the global commodity markets. Now, I'll quickly give you a, an idea of how this uh, business model can scale up in terms of revenues. So if we just look at Lima, Peru, where the first uh, site is going to be set up, we take the, the daily wa uh, plastic waste volumes in Lima. 30% of this is currently collected. So let's say we can get 10% of that, so we get 3% of what's, what's being collected. With that, 
multiplying that by the, the price per kilo of plastic on the global commodity market currently, which is about two euro twenty per kilo, we have twelve million dollar revenue per year. Well, of course, this is a stylized example, but this shows you that even at a very low collection volume, this is still a very profitable business model, at least in terms of revenues and taking into account that costs are just mostly related to several capital elements, this could be a very profitable business model. So, tying it all together, do we have a triple bottom line? We believe we do. So we address the bottom of the pyramid, we address poverty, we try to get rid of plastic waste, which is a huge issue in these regions. It is a scalable and potentially profitable business model, as you've seen, and therefore we offer a triple bottom line value in this uh, business model. So, of course, because I'm going to do the work for you now, there are some critical questions to be asked. And we, we basically had four questions. First of all, does Plastic Bank really address the issue with this business model in the way they, in the way they do it? Secondly, the logistics of the waste collection, how are they going to do it? Especially if you work with a local community, like how are these efforts going to, to scale up? And does that really work? Thirdly, how are we going to create awareness and educate the local community that this is the way to go? And finally, why not just offer people locally money in exchange for the waste that they collect for you? Um, and Plastic Bank has some answers to this. Um, and of course, you're free to ask me these questions uh, again, and I will try to answer them for you. But for now, we'd just like to leave you with this, um, because we still are facing a major issue here. And I think the message of Plastic Bank is pretty clear. Help us try to turn abundance of waste into an abundance of opportunity. Thank you very much.